The top stories tonight and why news? No need for Vice President Lenny Robredo to be appointed in the Interagency Task Force if her intentions to help in the response are genuine, says Malacanang. Russia's Defense Ministry begins testing coronavirus vaccine. Local broiler raisers want chicken importation ban. Various Metro Manila cities allot budget for purchase of gadgets for distance learning in school year 2020 to 2021. South Asians with COVID-19 are at greater risk of dying in a hospital, a study in the United Kingdom show. Artists paint boarded up stores to bring hope to lower Manhattan. Good evening, Philippines and the world. Today is Friday, June 19, 2020. Join us in the next 45 minutes as we deliver today's top stories around the globe. I am Harleen Delgado. We are also seen in 1,935 satellite monitoring centers nationwide and via live streaming worldwide through the UNTV News and Rescue social media accounts and our website, untvweb.com. I am William P. First in the news, Malacanang says there was no need for Vice President Lenny Robredo to be appointed in the Interagency Task Force if her intentions to help in the response are genuine. Our Malacanang Palace correspondent Rosa Licoz gives the details why. Presidential spokesperson Harry Roque clarifies the Duterte administration acknowledges the contribution of Vice President Lenny Robredo in the response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Secretary Roque adds she is helping in her own ways. And if her intentions are genuine, there's no need for her to be appointed or designated in the Interagency Task Force against COVID-19. This is the presidential spokesperson's response to former Senator Antonio Trillanes' statement that VP Robredo should be appointed as the IATF chairperson so the COVID-19 response would be more productive and effective. The former lawmaker also slams the palace official for saying the vice president should present solutions, then criticize the government efforts. But Secretary Roque points out if the vice president could offer solutions on how to address the issue on locally stranded individuals testing positive for the disease after coming out negative in COVID-19 testing in Metro Manila, then he would be the one to submit the proposed solutions to the IATF. The palace official reiterates Trilliane should not be sowing intrigue and division during this COVID-19 crisis. Secretary Roque calls on Trillanes not to twist his statements and instead just do his share to alleviate the plight of the people amid the pandemic. Rosa Licoz, UNTV, News and Rescue. We serve the people, we give glory to God. Like President Rodrigo Duterte, other health officials fully support Secretary Francisco Duque III amid the Office of the Ombudsman's Probe. Our health correspondent, Aiko Miguel, will tell us why. Health Undersecretary Maria Rosario Vergere assures other officials still trust Health Secretary Francisco Duque III despite calls for him to step down. Yesterday, even Senator Sherwin Gachalian suggested that he take a leave of absence as the Office of the Ombudsman conducts an investigation into alleged irregularities in the Health Department's response to COVID-19. But according to Undersecretary Vergere, they see no reason Secretary Duque should take a leave of absence. We have our full support to the Secretary and we still think that he should be retained in uh, his position. Undersecretary Vergere stands firm that other DOH officials can accomplish their obligations well without a secretary to lead them. Uh, Napaka-importante ho ng isang leader sa isang uh, organisasyon. Kahit po nakaupo lang siya dyan, pero kung siya ay nire-respeto at siya ay nakakapagbigay ng kumpiyansa para sa mga taong niya, sa tingin ko po, kaya po gumagaling ang mga tao sa ilalim niya. Undersecretary Vergere also discloses she has no idea who among her fellow DOH officials will also be investigated by the Ombudsman aside from Secretary Duque. They haven't received a document from the Ombudsman as to what other things they must provide for the investigation. 
DOH officials say they are prepared for the Ombudsman's probe. I go Miguel, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. Health Undersecretary Maria Rosario Vergere clarifies she has not stated that Cebu City would be under enhanced community quarantine. She explains that she is not in the position to announce community quarantine restrictions, but only the IATF. Yusek Verjera's clarification comes after news circulated that she had stated Cebu City would be under ECQ. So, wala pong katotohanan. Ito pong, uh nasabing ito uh, uh, wala po tayong karapatan no we do not have any authority uh, para po makapagbigay ng mga ganitong impormasyon uh, it, it is only the interagency task force and the spokesperson Harry Roque who can provide the general public with this kind of information Meanwhile, the Department of the Interior and Local Government, or DILG, will not tolerate barangay officials who continuously violate quarantine protocols. In a statement, Interior Secretary Eduardo Año says that instead of serving as implementers, these officials are leading the deviation based on reports they receive. In a letter sent to Ombudsman Samuel Martires on June 16, 2020, DILG Undersecretary for Barangay Affairs Martin Dino said, 20 barangay officials were given show cause order for them to explain the allegations against them. Leia Ilagan has more of the details. What? DILG Undersecretary for Barangay Affairs Martin Dino discloses they have received various complaints against 20 barangay chairmen in Metro Manila, which prompted them to bring the concern up to the ombudsman. Yung inuman sa karsada na nabidyohan, tapos yung song is bingo during the COVID-19. Yung mga batang naglalaro sa karsada. So ito yung violation pagdating dito sa social distancing. The complaints include collecting fees in barangays for the issuance of quarantine passes. From 10 pesos to 500. Tapos naningil din ng, uh, para sa ID ng barangay para makakuha ng quarantine pass. Tapos ang sumunod na reklamo dyan, na reklamo dito naman sa pamimigay ng pagkain galing ang pondo, galing ng barangay at galing ng municipality. Ito, namili sila, yung mga kapitan na gawal, namili ng baby dyan. Pinuna mga kamag-anak, pinuna mga kaalyado. Pagkatapos, basta kaaway, hindi nabigyan. Under Secretary Dino has this reminder to public officials. Yung mga lumalabas ng unang case mas huliin nyo. Bawal yan, makakahawa yan. Tapos yung mga social distancing natin, yung mga chismosa, chismoso, yung mga sugarol, lasengo, mahuliin nyo yan, bawal yan. Bawal pa hanggang ngayon kahit na kag-ECQ tayo. Leia Ilagan, UNTV, News and Rescue. We serve the people, we give glory to God. During the 48-hour hard lockdown in two barangays in Manila City, hundreds of residents underwent rapid testing for COVID-19. Dante Amento tells us why. Rapid testing for coronavirus infection in Manila City's barangays 163 and 60 concluded today. In barangay 163, where 198 residents got tested, no one turned out positive for the disease. But the case is different in Barangay 60. Out of 228 residents tested, six individuals tested positive in the rapid test including a police frontliner. The six proceeded to swab testing right away to confirm the test result. Now they await the outcome. Para at least malaman na natin kung talagang positive ba sila sa COVID kasi ang final talaga po yung swab test. Other residents, though asymptomatic, volunteered to undergo the swab test. Idel de la Cruz, a banker, wanted to be sure she is not a carrier nor has contracted the virus. To make sure lang na hindi ako carrier ng virus kasi may mga kasama din ako sa bahay. Mm -hmm. Then para at least alam ko may peace of mind na negative ako <laughs> if ever. Amid the 48-hour hard lockdown, authorities apprehended nine violators. After po niyan, uh, i-case file po yung kaso na yan. So, lalabas din po yan sa, sa police clearance nila at saka sa NBI clearance. They are facing charges for violating Section 9 of Republic Act 11332 or non-cooperation 
and Article 151 of the Revised Penal Code or Disobedience. The hard lockdown in the two barangays, including Barangay 844, will end at 11.59 p.m. tomorrow. Dante Amento, UNTV, News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. And now 1,700 PNP personnel in Paralac have undergone rapid testing for the novel coronavirus disease. This aims to ensure the health of police frontliners. Wala nang gagalaw, wala nang kikilos kung mismo ang PNP ay magkakaroon nito. So, yun po yung iniiwasan natin. The PNP personnel who took the rapid testing from Monday to Thursday this week tested negative for COVID-19. Thank you, Paul. Meanwhile, Russia's Ministry of Defense and the Gamalay Institute of Epidemiology and Microbiology have started human trials of a vaccine for COVID-19. That's according to a statement from the Defense Ministry released yesterday. Following a two-week period in isolation, a group of 18 volunteers received the trial vaccine on Thursday. Approval for the trials was issued by the Ministry of Health. The Steps will be taken according to the protocol approved by the Ministry of Health. The volunteers will be examined by doctors after 30 minutes, 2 hours, 6 hours, and 12 hours during the first 24 hours. Any complaints will be noted. The place of injection will be examined for redness, swelling, sores. Temperature will be taken regularly. Pressure, heart rate, breathing, lung capacity, and tonsils are all monitored. As of Tuesday, June 16, neither the Russian Ministry of Defense nor the Gamalay Institute of Epidemiology and Microbiology appeared in the World Health Organization's draft landscape of COVID-19 candidate vaccines. However, the list does include other Russian organizations, including State Research of Center of Virology and Biotechnology Vector, the St. Petersburg Scientific Research Institute of Vaccines and Serums and BioCAD. A group of broiler raisers want to ban the importation of chicken due to its effect on local production. In fact, the country now has an oversupply of chicken, but the prices in the market are not decreasing. Ray Pelayo, who monitors the country's chicken supply, will join us tonight to tell us why live. Yes, Ray, good evening. Good evening, William. Farm gate prices of uh, chicken in the previous months went down to as low as 25 pesos per kilogram last April, particularly in uh, Nueva Ecija. The United uh, Broiler Racers Association, or UBRA, raises this concern and argues that uh, one of the reasons of unstable price of chicken is importation. UBRA President Attorney uh, Elias Jose Inchong said they cannot accept the reason the Bureau of Animal Industry is giving, citing the agreement on the World Trade Organization for not implementing import ban. Bai said that the country imports materials only for processed chicken products. So, ang tawag po natin dyan ay mechanically debunked meat. Okay. Mura po yun, yun ang i-import sa Pilipinas. Pagkatapos po ay yun ang idadagdag sa hotdog, ah, mga dilata. But Ubra is not convinced and demands a data system for reform. Wala tayong data system eh. Kaya lahat nagtitis, lahat bulak. Kapatid gobyerno bulak, hindi nila alam kung ano level ng supply. Kailangan pa ba mag-alaga? Kung meron data system, eh hindi lahat mga kapag-desisyon na maayos. Will? Yes, uh, Ray, what about the country's supply of chicken? Uh, how is it now? Well, the country has an oversupply of uh, chicken. Bai said this is an effect of the uh, restriction made during the quarantine period in the past uh, months that limited the movement and the demand 
for uh, chicken. But even if uh, we have over oversupply, the prices of chicken in the market still ranges from 140 to 160 pesos per uh, kilogram. Well, thank you uh, very much, Ray Palayo, for that report. The Zamboanga tourism industry has lost estimated revenues amounting to 897 million pesos since the beginning of the enhanced community quarantine period last March brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic. The city tourism office attributes such loss to cancellations of huge activities with what with travel restrictions to add to that are more than 6,000 jobs that are gone. The city's business sector is also losing billions of pesos due to the closure of small and medium enterprises. Mayor Ben Climaco says that tourism activities should not resume yet due to the continued rise in COVID-19 cases in the city. Zamboanga City is presently under general community quarantine based on IATF resolution number 46. The Bureau of Internal Revenue now requires all bloggers and filmmakers that earn from digital advertisements to register with the agency. But small vloggers and online sellers need not worry. Monok Son will explain why. The Bureau of Internal Revenue has released the list of online merchants required to register with the agency. These include e-commerce platform providers internet retailers of consumer goods, digital service, membership and subscription, digital transaction through the use of electronic platforms and media, online blogging, filmmakers who earn from advertising gained from their online channels, and ride-hailing services for food, transportation, delivery, or merchandise. Small vloggers and online sellers need not worry because the BIR clarified that only those earning more than 250000 annually will be required to pay income tax. According to website TrueBuddy, some Filipinos are earning hugely, whether through vlogging or filmmaking, such as Alex Gonzaga with an estimated income of 185000 to 2.9 million pesos per month. Siblings Rans Kyle and Niana Guerrero with an estimated combined income of 600,000 to 9 million pesos a month. And the YouTube channel Rafi Tulfo in Action with an estimated income of 3.2 million pesos up to 50 million pesos per month. Every YouTube video and channel page visits earned from online advertisements. Online ads are just one of the sources of income of bloggers and filmmakers aside from product endorsement and income paid by YouTube. The BIR orders its more than 120 revenue district officers nationwide to release the Certificate of Registration of Digital Sellers of Goods and Services in a day or two upon the submission of an application. The BIR estimates there are 6 million big, medium, and minimal digital merchants operating in the country. Submission of an application, payment, and release of the paper shall be done at same counter reserve for senior citizens and persons with disabilities. The registration fee is 500 pesos plus 30 pesos for documentary stamp packs. Monokson, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people, we give glory to God. Thousands of online jobs have opened for applicants looking to work from home in observance of the new normal. But Dole reminds online job seekers of some guidelines for applying for virtual employment. Asher Kadapan Jr. tells us why. Online English teacher Michelle Lucero has been working from home for three years. With this, she enjoys more time with her family and get to save more by not having to travel to work. Well, first of all, it's office space kasi nakakapagod yung biyahe and yung time travel talaga consuming. So pagdating mo ng office, pagod ka na, tapos mag-work and then pag-uwi, travel ulit. All she needs is a computer and a reliable internet connection for her bread and butter. With 30,000 vacancies open just in the company she works, she encourages online job seekers to take advantage of the opportunity. First, because it's very convenient. You don't have to travel. You just have, you just need to stay at home. You can work in the convenience of your home. But the Department of Labor and Employment, or DOLE, reminds the online job hunters of some basic guidelines upon applying for virtual employment. First, you have to check 
uh, yung kung meron po silang official website at ano pong klaseng information yung mga nasa website po nila. Pangalawa po, kung nakuha po natin yung pangalan, i-check din po natin for instance with uh, BIR, with BTI, or even with the local government units kung uh, ito po ba ay may mga permits and licenses uh, sa, na nakaregister po sa kanisa nilang mga ahensya. A legitimate list of employers and work agencies can be found on the Labor Department's website. Dole reiterates the importance of understanding and securing a copy of their contract with their employers for their own guidance and protection. Anyone is encouraged to raise their grievances to Dole through their hotline number 1349. Asher Kadapan Jr., UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. Motorcycle taxis cannot serve the riding public for now, yet they are preparing for when they get the green light. They presented their recommendations uh, for safety of both pa the passengers and the riders. Joan Nano tells us why. Motorcycle taxi firms Joyride and Ancas are planning to use a special suit for riders if the government will give them the green light to resume their operations. Aside from using plastic barriers, the motorcycle taxi firms will also require passengers to bring and wear their own helmets. It's a prototype. It is actually a, a combination of uh, the shield plus parang uh, raincoat na PPE and the thing no nung nung, uh, nung suit. This is basically um, a protective shield. Um, tapos um, na may flaps po siya sa side for aerodynamic. Plastic po to, no? so it's very firm and sturdy and also malleable. However, Malacanang explains that the Department of Health still has to study the effectiveness of these shields in protecting both the riders and passengers from the virus. Presidential Spokesperson Secretary Hari Roque also said that motorcycle taxis are still not allowed to operate. Pinag-aaralan po talaga nila if that suit will be sufficient po to uh, more or less provide distancing of sorts. No? Um, so pag-aaralan po yan. In a statement, the Department of Transportation says the pilot test run for motorcycle taxis concluded last April and that they have submitted the recommendation to Congress. The DOTR further explains there is nothing to resume for the meantime as the Congress needs to pass a law to legalize the operations of motorcycle taxis as a mode of public transportation. Joan Anano, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. 26 airports in the country already permit the operation of commercial flights. The corresponding local government units have provided clearance for their operations, while Metro Manila and other areas are still under general community quarantine. But some local governments still require passenger restrictions in accordance with their respective protocols. Six more airports are scheduled to open for commercial flights in the coming weeks, while 17 others have yet to signify the dates when they will restart commercial flights. Meanwhile, the Iloilo Provincial Government has temporarily halted the acceptance of locally stranded individuals coming from Cebu due to the continuing rise in COVID-19 cases in the province. The decision comes after a Bureau of Fire Protection personnel tested positive for COVID-19 entered Iloilo from neighboring Cebu. When stranded individuals from Cebu may enter Iloilo again has not been announced yet. All flights from Iloilo to Cebu have also been cancelled. The provincial government will also limit the number of returning stranded individuals and OFWs in Metro Manila to 1,500 per week. Fewer individuals are donating blood due to community quarantine restrictions and the danger of being infected by the COVID-19, according to the Philippine Blood Center. Data from the center show that from an average blood collection of 4,000 to 5,000 a month, PBC was able to collect only around 1,400 blood bags last March, with the number going down as much as 440 in April. Despite this, the demand for blood supply continues for various medical cases. Ang blood collection natin talagang nasa critical level na nasa down to 10% kami uh, ng usual namin na ano na 
na blood collection. Meanwhile, the Philippine Blood Center is urging the public to donate blood but with precautions. More details why from Vincent Arboleda. Under the DOH Memorandum No. 124 Series of 2020, blood donation is considered an essential activity by the Department of Health. Hence, it is exempt from several restrictions, provided that it follows certain provisions. This includes the implementation of social distancing measures and finishing the event within four hours. Only 50 healthy donors who live in the area are allowed to attend the event and donate. Senior citizens, pregnant women, persons with comorbidities, and those with fever and other symptoms of severe respiratory diseases are not allowed to enter. According to Dr. Tagayuna, every mobile blood donation will undergo a strict process to ensure the safety and well-being of those attending the event. The blood center also accepts individual donors. If one does not have a vehicle, the PBC can arrange for it and pick you up at your residence to donate to their facility. They are also willing to issue blood donors pass to those voluntary donors outside of Metro Manila. According to the Department of Health, every bag of blood can save up to three persons' lives. For those willing to voluntarily donate blood, please call the Philippine Blood Center's hotline through the telephone number 8995-3846. Vincent Arboleda UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. No vaccine, no face-to-face -face classes. That was the directive from the president himself. And as the country's education department implements alternative learning modalities, some cities in Metro Manila have already bared its plan in gearing up for this school year's distance learning. The city government of Manila earlier announced it will buy 110,000 tablets for public school students and 11,000 laptops for teachers worth 994 million pesos. The tablets will have a SIM card that comes with a 12 gigabyte bandwidth data allocation per month, while the laptops will have a pocket Wi-Fi. In Quezon City, a 2.9 billion peso supplemental budget has been approved for the city's blended learning system under the new normal. This will be used for the purchase of gadgets for over 150,000 enrolled junior high school students and more than 19,000 senior high school students. Internet allowance will also be given to public school teachers from kindergarten to grade 12. The Kazan City government adds printed modules and learning packets containing flash drives will also be distributed particularly to grade school students. Meanwhile, Pasig City has raised 1.2 billion pesos to purchase laptops and tablets for public school teachers and learners from elementary level to senior high school. The city government will also be providing gadgets for over 2,000 students of the Pamantasa ng Lungsod ng Pasig. And in Paranaque City, 500 million pesos has been allocated for the purchase of 7,000 tablets to the city's kindergarten and grade 1 pupils and 300 laptop units to public school teachers. A 6,000 annual allowance will also be distributed to 16,000 junior and senior high school students in the city. However, the Department of the Interior and Local Government has reminded LGUs that will donate learning gadgets to public school to comply with the minimum technical specifications set by the Department of Education. Meanwhile, education will no longer be a problem in the remote and coastal areas of Odiongan town, Romblon. As early as now, the local government is preparing modules and flash disks that contain learning materials for students. Another plan is to set up a local TV channel in the municipality of Adyongon intended to broadcast lessons to support modular learning. The local government will also provide flash disks in remote areas that cannot be reached by local television signal. According to Adyongon Mayor Trina Firmalo Fabic, they are gearing up for the challenge for local government and the teachers to teach under the new normal situation. They are making sure there will be enough teachers in their town to guide the students. William, we are on board the UN TV radio mobile mm -hmm. booth and we are here in Kazon Avenue in Kazon City. Let's take a look at the situation on the road. 
William, so far we have a light traffic situation here in our area along westbound lane of Quezon Avenue from EDSA going to Espana, Manila. Meanwhile, expect a light to moderate traffic situation on the other side of the road along the eastbound lane for vehicles coming from Manila going to EDSA. And for our weather update... The Intertropical Convergence Zone, or ITCZ, is affecting southern Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. According to Pagasa, the ITCZ will bring cloudy skies with scattered rain showers and thunderstorms over Metro Manila, Bicol Region, Mimaropa, Visayas, and Zamboanga Peninsula. Possible flash floods or landslides may occur due to scattered moderate to at times heavy rains. Meanwhile, the rest of the country will experience partly cloudy to cloudy skies with isolated rain showers caused by localized thunderstorms. No active tropical cyclone is spotted within the Philippine area of responsibility. Malacanang confirms President Rodrigo Duterte will attend the Association of Southeast Asian Nations or ASEAN virtual meeting on June 26. The virtual summit will be led by Vietnam as the chair this year. The annual summit was deferred in April due to the coronavirus pandemic. ASEAN leaders are expected to discuss various issues in the region, including the present global health emergency. Senator Laila de Lima has expressed dismay over the decision of a court that has denied her to participate in the Senate's online proceedings while in detention. On June 1, the lady senator filed an omnibus motion to join Senate sessions via teleconferencing while at the PNP Custodial Center in Quezon City, noting the Senate has amended its rules and allowed hybrid sessions due to the COVID-19 pandemic. In a joint order from the Muntinlupa Court, Branch 205 released on June 17, Judge Lizelle Akita noted that the presumption of innocence does not carry with it the full enjoyment and of civil and political rights. The judge concludes allowing the senator to participate in the Senate sessions and hearings via teleconferencing is no different from allowing her to attend there physically. De Lima maintains that she is still in full possession of her civil and political rights, noting that she has not been convicted of of any crime. The lady senator intends to file a motion for reconsideration on the matter. Meanwhile, the country's Department of Health says that 661 new cases were reported today, including 460 fresh cases and 201 late ones. That raises the total confirmed cases of coronavirus infection in the country to 28,459. That is as of 4 p.m. today. We have lost 14 more patients, but through our fervent prayers, medical interventions, and sacrifices of our medical frontliners, 288 more people have won their battle against the invisible enemy. That brings the total recoveries nationwide to 7,378. Thanks be to God. Let's now take a closer look at the updated count of coronavirus cases around the world. The COVID-19 pandemic has now reached a total of more than 8.5 million confirmed cases. There's no addition to the 188 countries, regions and sovereignty affected by the global health emergency. The fast-spreading disease has claimed over 450,000 lives, while close to 4.17 million patients across the globe have recovered from the new coronavirus infection. The United States of America, as of today, remains to have the most recorded cases, now at close to 2.2 million, while healthcare workers in the U.S. have helped almost 600,000 patients recover from the infection. Brazil trails behind the USA with over 978,000 confirmed cases, with more than half a million recoveries as of today, but has the second highest death toll next Next to the USA. And for the news abroad, here's Jovic Burmas live from London, United Kingdom. Good evening, Jovic.
Good evening, William, and also to Diego and Harleen. How are you? Yes, uh, Diego, uh, uh, Jovic, I am fine. Uh, I hope you are too. And uh, what have you got for us tonight? William, a study here in the UK finds that South Asians with COVID-19 are at greater risk of dying in hospital, a UK study finds. I will give you more details why in a bit. Also, why Mexico and India are busy preparing facilities for hospital space and why another minister in Brazil steps down in the middle of the COVID pandemic. Okay, uh, Jovic, uh, go ahead and tell us why. People from South Asian backgrounds that are admitted in British hospitals due to coronavirus are at greater risk of dying based on a recent major UK analysis. The study assessed 4 in 10 of all hospitalized patients with COVID-19 across England, Wales and Scotland until the middle of May. They found South Asians are the only ethnic group that have a higher death rate of 20% more than their white counterparts, partly due to high cases of diabetes. The study, considered to be the largest of its type in the world, revealed 390 die out of 1,000 South Asian people requiring hospital treatment for COVID-19 as compared to 290 deaths for every 1,000 Caucasians. The study involved 27 institutions across the country, including academic universities, public health organizations, and 260 hospitals across Great Britain. Professor Ewan Harrison from the University of Edinburgh says that South Asians are definitely more likely to die from COVID-19 in hospital, although they don't see a strong effect in the black group. SAGE, the UK government's scientific advisory group, has been given full access to the details of analysis and may impact its decision on who gets priority to coronavirus vaccines based on ethnicity once they become available. Mexico has repurposed a Formula One race track to create new hospital space to ease the strain on, health, on its health system in the mounting coronavirus pandemic. Mexico has logged almost 160,000 cases and more than 19,000 fatalities, the seventh highest total worldwide. To prevent the system from collapsing, authorities in the epicenter of the outbreak, Mexico City, have scrambled to conjure up additional capacity to meet surging demand as the country tries to exit lockdown and revive the economy. The Mexican army reconditioned three barracks into clinics and added 400 hospital beds. Meanwhile, the Navy built so-called voluntary isolation centers in the city to house patients with mild symptoms. Authorities put another 200 beds in a temporary hospital inside a convention center and established a similar clinic at a racetrack typically used for Formula One and rock concerts. Health experts say Mexico may be close to the peak of new infections, but the government has repeatedly had to walk back its forecasts for when that would occur. India has been converting a spiritual center into what it claims will be the world's biggest temporary hospital with 10,000 beds to treat a surge in the number of COVID-19 cases. On Monday, a government mobile app showed that of Delhi's 9,940 COVID-19 beds, almost 5,500 were occupied. Of the 100 private and public hospitals listed in the app, 25 had no beds available. India is the, forced, or is the fourth worst affected country in the world with cases steadily increasing. The country has registered over 12,000 deaths related to the coronavirus. Prime Minister Narendra Modi imposed a nationwide lockdown in late March that has since been eased, including the opening of shops and places of worship. California orders residents to wear masks at nearly all times outside the home. The mandate is one of the bro uh, The mandate is one of the broadest of any U.S. state. Californians must wear masks anytime they leave their homes, with exceptions made for people eating and drinking in restaurants or exercising outdoors as long as they maintain six feet of physical distance. 
Governor uh, Gavin Newsom said in a stern statement announcing the new directive, simply put, we are seeing too many people with faces uncovered, putting at risk the real progress we have made in fighting the disease. California's strategy to restart the economy and get people back to work will only be successful if people act safely and follow health recommendations. That means wearing a face covering, washing your hands and practicing physical distancing, Newsom said. The statement left unclear how the state intended to enforce the order, which recommends face coverings even for people driving alone in their cars. Representative uh, Representatives for the California Department of Public Health could not be reached for any comments. The state has recorded more than 163,000 cases of COVID-19 and over 5,000 deaths, according to data. Another minister of Brazil's far-right president, Jair Bolsonaro, steps down in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. Here's why from Chris Perez. Brazil's Education Minister Abraham Weintraube announced his resignation Thursday after finding himself surrounded by a variety of scandals and controversies. Standing alongside Bolsonaro, on a brief video he posted on Twitter, he said this time it's that he is leaving the Ministry of Education. Weintraube added he would be leaving in the coming days to begin working at the World Bank. Since April last year when he began his stint as Education Minister, Weintraube had become one of President Jair Bolsonaro's most controversial ministers. Last Sunday, he was fined for not wearing a face mask at a pro-Bolsonaro rally in capital Brasilia, where masks have been mandatory in public places since April to fight the spread of the new coronavirus. After that incident, he tweeted, they're trying to shut me up at any price. There have been talks in recent days that Weintraube was about to be fired, specifically after his remarks about the Supreme Court. The court is presently overseeing a series of probes that involve the Brazilian president and his inner circle. Tension has mounted between the president and its justices. Weintraube's resignation comes a month after Brazil's health minister Nelson Tyke stepped down after only weeks on the job amid the COVID-19 pandemic. He becomes the 12th among Brazilian ministers who have resigned since 2019 and the 6th this year. Chris Perez, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people, we give glory to God. And those are the reasons behind the news here in the United Kingdom and in other parts of the globe. Back to you, William. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Jovic Vermas uh, reporting live from London, United Kingdom. Please stay safe over there. An artist in New York went around her neighborhood and asked managers of board up stores for permission to paint. From a small piece of art, the streets will be full of color and picturesque scenery soon. Here's why from Nina Armilio. It's been um, so depressing around here. Boarded up shops have been a depressing sight for New Yorkers after looting amid anti-racism protests following the May 25 death of George Floyd in Minneapolis police custody. But a group of artists are slowly transforming those boards into canvases of hope with the power of their paint brushes and bright colored paint. Led by Sono Kuwayama, best known for her installations, employing painting, sculpture, and video, the army of artists hope to cheer up the trendy but now gloomy Browery neighborhood where Kuwayama lives. I just want someone to smile, you know, to walk by and just smile because it's something that's beautiful and lights up their, their soul or their heart. At first, no other artist came, so she started the initiative by herself. She then assembled a team of local artists, many of them eager to leave their four-month lockdown confinement and create spaces outside with their own supplies. Charlie Hudson, 28, was the first local painter to answer Kuwayama's call. It's like just seeing the city boarded up and in the middle of a pandemic is it's really uncomfortable to see it. 
Hudson hopes his countryside scene could give people some space to ponder with. The response from store owners and building managers to this art from local painters has been enthusiastic. It gives people and artists something to do and to work on. And who knows, maybe we can preserve these later and have a gallery and remember this time in a different way. Kuwayama said this is to contribute in the best way she could amid this depressing time through her art. That's really all it's about, is just, you know, bringing a gift to the city, to the community, and, and hopefully it could just spread all over. Nina Armilio, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. Uh, yes, Harleen, um, as of course uh, the next few months uh, approaches, we know that the Philippines uh, will experience the wet or rainy season. Yes, William, and as we all know, as announced by Bagasa last week, rainy season is here. So that, uh, so William, let's take a reminder. Let's uh, let's remind our uh, kababayans who have to go out and uh, to go to their work to always, always bring their umbrellas and raincoats as they uh, go out and always take care of themselves, especially this rainy season. Yes, and also a uh, bigger problem now that we face the coronavirus pandemic, usually in uh, some of the areas that have mm. flooding, you know, it's very difficult to uh, exercise physical or social distancing. And um, also it uh, compromises mm -hmm. our immune system uh, due to uh, uh, things like uh, flu and pneumonia. So I think we really need to have to gear up, make sure that people are healthy and they know the uh, protocols to be able to avoid these things. Mm -hmm. And William, speaking of COVID-19, with your mm -hmm. indulgence, I would like to take this opportunity to say thank you to our frontliners. Thank you yes. so much for all your dedication, your hard work, your sacrifices every single day. Thank you so much and we pray for your everyday safety. Yes, and also to the whole uh, population in general. We also urge everyone to work together to be able to uh, win mm -hmm. this uh, battle uh, uh, over uh, COVID-19 so that we have to uh, stay safe by washing our hands, wearing our face masks, and um, do try to be considerate of other people. I mean, if, for example, you feel uh, you feel sick or you get tested uh, positive in rapid uh, testing, do um, be responsible and quarantine yourself so as to prevent the further spread of the virus. Mm -hmm. That's right, William. It's very important and uh, critical mm -hmm. these days to really follow the minimum yes. health protocols when you go outside, especially now that the restrictions are easing up in yes. different parts of the country. So we really have to do our part for us to survive and surpass this COVID-19 pandemic. Yes, I agree. Those are the reasons behind the news June 19, 2020. I am Harleen Delgado. We serve the people. We give glory to God. And I am William Theo because we need to know we will always ask why. Have a great evening and a great weekend, everyone.